Hey, this is Lisa for TheBuzzAbout.com. Today I'm joined by Dar Williams here at Music Fest, a 10-day music festival in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. It's an amazing atmosphere out there. Yeah. It's, it's insane, people from all over the country. But Dar, thanks for joining us. The latest project is Promised Land. Yep. Um, Suzanne Vega, Marshall Crenshaw, lend their talents. Can you tell us a little bit about the project? A few years to, to write it and get it produced and then done and mixed. <laughs> um, but it was, um, there's just a lot of, uh, I guess, it's a lot of, the tension in the album is a lot of people um, navigating tight spots quickly. So, uh, and that's, I think that's something that you face when you're, you know, you're working and you know what you're going to do and you're living where you're going to live and you're with the person you're going to live and you, you know, live with them. It's just like busy and then you find yourself, you know, with all your time committed and, and then there's these moral crossroads <laughs> that you have to face quickly, you know, and, and right. what do you do living in actual time and space? So I, I think that there are a lot of stories like that that show up on the album, but paradoxically I took a lot of time to write those stories. I, I took a lot of time and space to kind of figure out what those, each story was on the record. So it was written actually in this very airy fairy um, nice opportunity I just gave myself to, to really think through who the characters were and really what the songs were. Right. Now, Dar fans were waiting for the new album to come out. <laughs> yeah. Not too long ago, you played Pete Seeger's 90th birthday celebration at Madison Square Garden with Bruce Springsteen and Joe Baez. And can you just tell us a little bit about what that experience was like? It, you know, it was very, uh, here's the thing, it's such a, it's like, it's a real contradiction and it's really difficult to have a party for Pete Seeger, because he's all about being the person who allows other people to shine, and so he doesn't like stuff like this, and I know him and I know his family, and I know, so there was this part of me like, stop telling him happy birthday, stop talking about him, don't look at him, don't even look. <laughs> and. And then I stepped out on the, the stage. It was really cool backstage, but when I stepped onto the stage and the whole audience was singing and it was, you know, great-grandparents, grandparents, parents, I mean, like, generations singing along so free. Like, they just knew that that was their job. Right. That was, that was when the whole night just totally took off in a spaceship. Like, I'd never been a part of that before. And, I think for Pete, that was also the moment. Apparently somebody said the moment he stepped on the stage, you know, he got it. So mm -hmm. the star was the audience. Dar has an incredible fan base. <laughs> and years ago, um, there were young women uh, who called themselves darlings. And you used to share this stage often times with Ani DeFranco, and these young women would charge the stage pumping their fist to your songs. So as a performer, what does that, what does that feel like? That was the 90s. That was, that was, um, that was a time when um, people were, um, there was something on the other side of the silence equals death thing. I don't know if it was because Clinton was president or because some of these drugs were coming out so that you could be HIV positive but still have some lifestyle. You know, there was a lot of like safe sex parties and stuff. Like there was just more. We were in a new era, and suddenly we had all these people who had you know come out of the closet and been really um, assertive about their rights to be sexual beings who gravitated in all directions and who identified not just in terms of their orientation but in terms of their whole sense of gender with all sorts of people, you know, there was like a, a playful, celebrational side to it that started to happen in the 90s. And then Ani came along with a different hair thing and very androgynous sometimes, very bisexual, very proud. And um, and I kind of came along in the wake of that. And because I came along with a song called When I Was a Boy and songs like that and songs that were not gender identified, mm -hmm. um, because as a woman, I just, you know, people who don't like gay people don't like women. Like, they don't. So, so it's my struggle, too. And, and I love the androgyny and I love the playfulness that, that I experience you know, as a straight person, you know. So I came along into this whole party. <laughs> and it was 
it was something that was meant to be set to music. Right. So it was, I was doing the right thing at the right time. Uh, I was I was making music, you know. People were sort of dancing to this this movement at this point. So that's that was a great takeoff point. And now it's more the norm. It was more revolutionary at, right. that, at that moment. One of your most beloved songs is a song entitled Iowa, which for a dar devotee um, is it's often misunderstood and try, interpreted in many different ways. So I went on a pilgrimage of sorts to Iowa to try to understand it. Mm -hmm. Did it happen? It, it, I didn't, it didn't happen. <laughs> I was waiting for the dar moment. I'm in the middle of Iowa City, uh, city no, no, no. trying to channel you. <laughs> so can you, can, you give, can you give us any insight into that? Give, give the fans a little insight into Iowa. You know what, here's the thing. A friend of mine went out to Iowa City to, to be in grad school, and it was one of these moments where I passed the barrier. The only time I'd really been in the Midwest was that kind of you're traveling on I-80, I-90, <laughs> I-something, you know, and you are very disappointed because you just feel like everybody's wandering around truck stops looking lost, like you think that that's the country you live in. And Iowa City is totally funky. It's got the best co-op in the, one of the best in the country. You know, I love it. Totally great people work there. All these sort of bi biodynamic things going on with farming that kind of go through that city, mm -hmm. and um, and then you just got all these really funky artists and, and people doing their thing. And then and I, and this friend of mine living out there and completely at home in this midwestern city. And we came from New York, and it was it was that. And then um, when I was one year when I was out there, I found out that I was going to work with really awesome booking agents and a manager and everything, and that was really good news. And um, the next year I was there, I found out I was going to go up and for Joan Baez, <laughs> or that I was going to go sing with her on a song and uh, oh, wow. for a live recording. So magic things happen in Iowa. And um, I guess I just got to see that, that I, I do think that the Midwest is different as a terrain and different in its attitude, but it's no less funky, no less creative you know, completely biodiverse and, and hilly and, and all of those things. Just, and in some ways, because it's sort of more spread out and flat, you can, in some places, you can see that more. And I don't know, there was, and also this, the landscape was undulating. And it just seemed like this incredibly poetic place where actually things were not so hyper that nobody noticed. It just seemed beautiful. And the people that I met there were so cool and beautiful <laughs> and it was a romantic thing to me so and the song is about looking for love and I was in love with my manager at the time and I was and he loved trains so I had that line about crossing the train tracks <laughs> and then we went out for a couple years which is great but um, the uh, the song was kind of a, a calling an evocation that had a lot to do with hitting that undulating terrain at the same time that I totally yeah, love this guy Okay, hey, I'll go back to Iowa and try again. Um, <laughs> I think your one of your most famous songs is Babysitter. So when I was, I was a teenager and I heard it for the first time, and I thought, oh, what would it be like to have Dar Williams as a babysitter? And my parents didn't know what to think. They said, are you trying to come out as a vegan? I'm like, no, <laughs> just try, try to. Um, but so, so if that happened, can you think of what movie might we watch? Uh, oh, if I was to babysitter, what would we watch? Oh, gosh, well, you know, um, nothing that you really wouldn't expect. You know, Finding Nemo is like, <laughs> that's what everybody, I mean, that's a classic. That is it a is beautifully a written film. And, you know, it, every time I see Ellen DeGeneres, I, I love her more and more because of that role that she played. I mean, I have a sort of r ridiculous attachment to, to Finding Nemo. You and, can find tour dates, CDs, about the books, at darwilliams.com. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. Thank you. And um, check it out. Okay, we're out. Because I never took heavy words for granted.